Close your eyes for a minute. Get comfortable in your seats. You can place your hands, whatever, whatever works best for you. And then gently just allow your eyes to close and uh, watch your breath coming in and out through your nose. Starting with an out breath through your nose and then an in breath. And just allow any distractions that um, may have been going on or, you know, the rest of your day. Allow yourself to just come here and uh, let the rest of the day go. Whenever you find your mind wandering off, just go back to your breath. And since we're having a, uh, two nights of talks on spiritual partners, I would like you to imagine um, what that might be like for you, whether it be your current partner or someone maybe that you might be uh, longing for. And imagine um, what that person, you know, think back when you were younger, what you wanted all the qualities that person to have. Make a small list of maybe three or four qualities of, you know, how do I really want my spiritual partner to be like? And just allow them to come to your mind. And then I just want to pose a question to you in your mind. Um, do you think it's possible that you could find them? I mean, is there some place in your heart that you believe they exist? Or if you know, you're with your current partner, do you believe that this relationship could turn into something uh, holy and sacred? And all I ask is that you really just try to be open to that possibility. You know, is it possible I could find the partner of my dreams? Or is it possible my partner could become even more incredible, more holy, more sacred? Could it turn into that? And sort of tuck that away in the back of your mind. And as these teachings go through the next two nights, uh, try to listen with an open heart and, uh, and see if you could answer that question. And when you're ready, you can just open your eyes up. So for those of you who haven't been here before, welcome. Um, this is uh, two nights of free talks. Uh, and I do want to apologize. We had some scheduling logistical problems. I understand that tomorrow is Yom Kippur. And so I apologize for those people who um, won't be able to make it tomorrow night. And uh, I will keep that in mind the next time I schedule one of these talks. Um, Geshe Michael Roach and Chris here, spiritual partners. Uh, Geshe Michael is originally from, not too far from here, Phoenix, Arizona. He attended uh, Princeton University. And uh, he's a Geshe, which is equivalent to a doctorate of uh, theology, I would guess, in the Tibetan Buddhist monastery. Uh, as soon as he graduated Princeton, he went and uh, stayed and lived with his teacher in Hal, New Jersey, uh, Ken Rinpoche Geshe Loson Tarchin, for 25 years. And then between there and South India at Sarame Monastery, he got his Geshe. He's the first American to uh, have gotten this. Um, he's the founder of Diamond Mountain University, uh, co-founder. He's also the founder of Asian Classics Institute, which is a, a 18 course with, um, on the, sort of the, the monastic coursework that you might study in a monastery translated into English, along with uh, things like meditation modules, etc. Uh, also, Asian Classics Input Project, which finds rare texts uh, around the world, and we save them. Uh, and then Christy is from Los Angeles, California originally, attended uh, New York University. And uh, as soon as she was done studying at NYU, uh, she went on to study with probably the 
the greatest living masters, not only in the Tibetan tradition, uh, but in the Indian yoga traditions as well. She is a co-founder of Diamond Mountain University. She's also one of our professors there. Uh, Geshe-la and Christy have co-wrote um, a couple books, How Yoga Works, The Tibetan Book of Yoga, um, and I'm hoping maybe a spiritual partnership book might come out. Uh, so, without further ado, I would like to present Geshe Michael Roach and Christy McNally. Can you hear all right? In the back, if you can't hear, raise your hand. If you cannot hear. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm very sorry we're late. We had another uh, talk, uh, about a four hour talk, uh, just before this, and uh, it ran late. Um, this is the fifth version of a, of a teaching on spiritual partners. Uh, we go around the world, uh, we give talks about uh, ancient texts, and uh, we give talks about yoga. Uh, we give a lot of business talks. Uh, but every time we run into somebody, we were in New York a few days ago, and we were in a, we went to buy a juice somewhere, and this lady comes in and she says, Oh, oh, guess you might look a lot of Christy. Oh, I was in your talks in California. And she was all excited. And we were in silence at the moment. And uh, we were trying to tell her we were in silence, but she didn't get it. But anyway, uh, but she kept talking. And then, and then she said, I've been to the business talks. I've been to the yoga talks. But the most important one for me is the partner talks, you know, the spiritual partner talks. And we never intended to give five of these talks. But uh, it seems like uh, everybody in the world is interested in the opposite sex. So uh, it, it turns out to be the, the talks that people ask for the most. Mm -hmm. The way we've been doing it is, uh, what we like to do, is we like to go find an ancient text that, that gives a foundation for the talk. And then we like to present mm, how to find a, a good partner, uh, how to keep them, and then even if you can keep them, it would be nice to be happy with them. So uh, we try to uh, talk about those three different things. And, and we've been working with a famous Buddhist saint named uh, Nagarjuna. Uh, Nagarjuna lived 18 centuries ago, about 150 years after Christ. And he marks a very important period in Buddhism. Uh, Buddhism, by the time of Nagarjuna, was already uh, 600 years old. And it was already well developed. But uh, just before the time of Nagarjuna, a, a big change takes place in Buddhism. If you know about Buddhism, there are two great branches, uh, one called the Theravada, or the Hinayana, and the other called the Mahayana. And uh, these are the two great families of Buddhism. Mm. Up until the time of Nagarjuna, uh, all Buddhism was Hinayana, or Theravada. And then, in the time of Nagarjuna, there's some kind of big change takes place. Uh, obviously, there's some huge outside influence comes into Buddhism. And then Buddhism changes uh, from sort of a, a lonely monk in a cave, meditating by himself. It, it shifts to the idea of a bodhisattva. Uh, the idea of somebody who's uh, dedicating their life to serve other people, and very possibly inside the world, you know, like... Uh, I, that's the same self. Okay. Uh, very possibly still in the world. So, uh, by the, in this time of Nagarjuna was a very interesting time because uh, Buddhism was shifting from something that hermits did in caves, to something that maybe politicians, or businessmen, or family people could do uh, in their home, uh, and in their country. So, what we have based the talk on tonight is a teaching by Nagarjuna called, uh, in Tibetan it's called Shepichingi, Shiching. In Sanskrit it's called Sohileka. 
su, su means good, hard means heart, leka means uh, a letter of instruction, uh, like a gospel, uh, and it's, or an epistle. So it's a suhar leka means uh, a letter that Arya Nagarjuna, N Nagarjuna wrote to a king named Udayi Bhadra, uh, giving him advice about how to run his kingdom. And I like to think of it like uh, as, if the, as if George Bush were to call the Dalai Lama and consult with him on all important decisions. And uh, this is the custom in ancient India. Uh, it was very common for a king uh, who's ruling a very great country to call upon a, a Buddhist uh, monk or a saint and, and ask for advice. So this letter that you, this reading that you have in your hands uh, this is Aryanagarjuna's letter written to the king on how to run a kingdom. Uh, why is he called Nagarjuna? Where does the word Nagarjuna come from? Mm. There's these kind of huge spirits, uh, beings, called Nagas uh, in, in India. Uh, Nagas look like dragons. Uh, they're, they're big like dragons and, and they have special powers. And, and according to Buddhism, they live under the earth. And anywhere there's water, uh, a naga is under the earth there, like helping the water, uh, keeping the water there. I think Arizona doesn't have so many nagas. Uh, and we're trying to get more. Uh, but they're like huge dragon-like beings, and, and they have this uh, fascination with ancient books. So uh, if they come across like an ancient scripture or a book, they would sort of swipe it and take it down into their caverns. So instead of keeping jewels or gold or diamonds, they would keep books, piles of books. So the story goes that uh, Nagarjuna, uh, when he was a young man, uh, he needed a certain Buddhist book which had been uh, lost, already lost. So he decided to go to the land of the Nagas. And, and it's a long story, we won't tell tonight, but he journeyed uh, underground to the land of the Nagas. He encounters a Naga, this huge Naga king, you know. And so we found one of these uh, Naga kings uh, on, the, on the, we Googled it. I hope there's no copyright thing involved. Um, but uh, so you have this Naga there, the white Naga, and uh, Ayana Garjana is, uh, is, you know, is the magician trying to get this book out of the, out of the Naga without being killed. And you and your spiritual partner are there with Nagarjuna. Uh, you know, getting uh, advice on how to find a partner, how to keep them, how to be happy with them, okay? So, uh, we'll start. Uh, we didn't give you the whole uh, letter to the king because it's quite long. So what we did was we took out certain verses which relate to uh, spiritual partners and then we sort of shuffled them into an order that, would, uh, that we felt would be good for this talk. This talk will be, uh, we'll do the first half tonight, uh, we'll do the second half tomorrow night, and uh, halfway through tonight, uh, we'll take a break. Uh, we like to take a break because uh, we like to talk to people uh, who have come, and we also like you to get a chance to stretch and, and have refreshments, I believe. Yeah, and uh, we are, uh, what do they call that? The freshmen, refreshments are a trick to get you to donate money. Uh, yeah, they just give whatever they want, right? Yeah, you just give whatever you want for the refreshments. Uh, like if, if, you, if there's a cookie there that you would pay a dollar for normally, you pay $10. And, uh, and uh, Rebecca Vinicor is here in, in, in the front row here, and she, uh, runs a project. Uh, we have a university here near Tucson, Diamond Mountain, and every uh, once a year in the fall now, we send uh, a group of students to a Tibetan monastery to study uh, for about a month. And uh, they get diarrhea, uh, they get ancient wisdom, and uh, in equal amounts usually. And. Uh, <laughs> And uh, this just kind of helps them. Usually they're, they're broke, and this helps them with their airfare and, uh, you know, with, with the stuff they need when they're in the monastery. Uh, so the, and the monastery is very kind. 
the monks are, are very helpful. They, they uh, give them free instruction. They don't, uh, you know, in, I never paid anything for 25 years in the monastery. They, they believe in free instruction. And, but this is just to get them there and to get them some food. So, you know, uh, be generous during the break. Okay, we'll start. Uh, we'll go to page one, okay? <clears throat> Uh, I'm going to read it in Tibetan. It's a blessing. And uh, also, the Dalai, first Dalai Lama said, uh, if you know a foreign language, you should show off at the beginning of a talk so that uh, the people think you know what you're talking about. Okay. Um, this is about, what it says is, every single one of us has drunk more milk from our mother's breasts than would fill the oceans of this world. And those who have not, yet seen, have not seen emptiness shall drink infinitely more in the cycle of pain. They still have yet to live. Mm. This, of course, goes back to a Buddhist belief that uh, there's no beginning to the number of births that you and, that you and I have had. And, and you don't have to buy that, you don't have to believe it, but the idea is that uh, how old has life been in the universe, you see? Uh, in physics they call it a singularity event, right? Like the world blew, the, the universe blew up a certain number of billions of years ago. And, uh, but that doesn't say that there wasn't a universe before that, and that there wasn't one before that. And in Buddhism we believe that your soul or your spirit has traveled through infinite lifetimes. So you have been everything. You know, you have been uh, president of the United States countless times. You have been Miss America countless times. Uh, you have been everything. You have done everything possible. You have done, not once or twice, but since beginningless time, for time with no beginning, each one of us has done every possible thing there is to do. Uh, so if you look at the Pacific Ocean, the Atlantic Ocean, if you joined all the oceans together, and you looked at how much water that is, and then you uh, put together all the milk you have ever drunk from the breasts of your mother as a child, uh, the milk you have drunk in countless lifetimes is infinitely more than the oceans. Uh, you, you've done everything. You've been born countless times. You have lived countless lives. You have lived in countless worlds, and you have drunk countless quantities of milk uh, from the breast of your mother. Uh, and this relates to uh, spiritual partners, you see. Um, you get to a certain age, you know. Uh, we spend, a normal person spends their life, uh, one of the main things we do besides eat and work and watch TV is to, uh, is to try to find a, a companion. Uh, to try to find a partner, someone we can spend our life with. And I think most people throughout the course of their life, uh, it's a process of learning, right? We go through many failures. Uh, it starts, mine started in sixth grade, Paula Monday, uh, third row back in history class, you know? And, uh, no, and, and you know, you, you get to know them. And, uh, and I remember uh, I was going to go study with her. I got this note from her friend, right? She never sends you a note. Uh, her, her friend wrote me a note, said, Paula wants to go study with you, okay. And uh, then, uh, so I said, well, meet me out near the bleachers, way out in the back of the playground, like not where anybody can see, you know. And then I went and bought a ring, it was like five dollars, it was in Phoenix, turquoise, I remember. And then uh, she sat in the front row bleachers, I sat in like the fifth row, because I was so scared of her. And. Uh, <laughs> And then I said, I heard you want to go study. And she says, yeah. You know, I said, well, here's the ring, you know. And, and, I, uh, and I, like, tossed it at it. And, uh, and, you know, we went study for a while. I remember I actually went near her house once. And, uh, and it was scary. And then, and then, I don't know, halfway through the school year, I get this note from her friend. Paula, Paula doesn't want to be studying with you anymore. And, uh, and then the ring drops out on the floor, you know. And... Uh, and everybody's staring at me in the class, you know, and, and, uh, and that was number one, right? Uh, 
No, and then a, a normal person, all of us, I mean a normal person, then you had another one, and then you had another one, and then each time you thought, well, well, this is it, you know, this is the one. And then at least it should get better, you know, at least I should learn how to do this relationship thing better as I get older. Uh, but it's not necessarily the, the case, right? And, and also, uh, this is not the only lifetime in which you've gone through this thing of having a relationship. Uh, you meet them, you're all excited, uh, it's going good for a while, and then it, it declines and then you break up and maybe you hate them worse than if you never met them, right? Uh, and this goes over and over and over again. We have countless cycles in our life. What he's saying in this verse is that he's offering a new idea. It's called emptiness. Okay? It's called emptiness. And I remember when I first started to learn emptiness. You know, I went uh, to a Tibetan monastery. Uh, you know, the monk, they put me in a small room. It's uh, like uh, 10 feet by 10 feet, 12 feet by 12 feet. And they, they, the monk came in, uh, Geshe Losan Tarchin, Ken And he, he puts a Tibetan carpet on the floor. And he puts a little uh, table in front of it. And he says, you, you meditate here. You know, I said, okay. And uh, he says, you know how to meditate? I said, yeah, yeah, I know, I know. Later he called me, he called me Mr. I know, I know. Uh, and uh, so, okay, you meditate on emptiness. You know about emptiness? I said, I know, I, I know. And uh, he said, okay, well, you meditate. And then uh, he lived uh, in a connecting house on the second floor. He said, when you're, after a couple of days, you come up and see me. We'll see how your meditation was, you know? And then I told this story a lot of times. Maybe you're the only person here who didn't hear it, so I'll tell it again. Um, so I go up to his room afterwards, he says, did you meditate? I said, yes. He said, what did you meditate about? You told me to meditate on emptiness. Yeah. Okay. Then he says, oh, what's emptiness like? And I said, oh, it's like you close your eyes and you think black. Everything black. The whole world is black. <laughs> Completely black, you know. And he says, that's emptiness? I said, yeah, black, black. He says, oh, black, black. Yeah. And he says, that's ridiculous, you know? <laughs> and, and he wasn't a shy uh, teacher. He was quite stern. And he would say something like, Kyak Makambo, or Nyang Makambo, which means, uh, excuse me, it means uh, dried cat diarrhea. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> he'd say, he would say that, Nyang Makambo, and then he'd say, you go back, try again. So uh, I went back and I, you know, I, I meditated and I just tried to not think about anything. Then I went back to him. Did you meditate on emptiness? Yes. What is emptiness? You see it, you, you empty your mind. You think about nothing, you know. And he said, he's, he goes like this, he goes, think about nothing. You know? <laughs> and then he, he says, uh, so you're thinking about nothing? I said, yeah, yeah. He said, that's emptiness. I know, I know. And, and then he says, uh, so you're thinking really hard. Yeah, about thinking about nothing, right? Yeah. So you're thinking. Nyang makambo. You know, and then he sends me back again. And, and then now I say, I, I know, I know, I know, how, I know what it is now, you know. And I, I went back, I meditated, I came back. And he, he said, last time, you know, this is like in the first week of my training, in 1975. Okay. And, he, and he says, uh, what's emptiness? I said, uh, now I understand. Emptiness means nothing matters. You know? There's no good, there's no bad. There's no suffering, there's no pleasure. You know? Everything is the same. For a great yogi, for a great meditator, nothing matters. They just sit there, nothing matters. He says, Dile, Lakpa Nyamakambo. You know, that's like the most Nyamakambo you've had yet. You know, and, uh, and then it took me like, it took me like almost 25 years in this little room, same room, same carpet. Uh, the carpet got old, so did I. And, uh, and then finally, uh, slowly I got it. What Arya Nagarjuna is saying? Oh, by the way, Arya in, in, uh, in ancient Buddhism doesn't mean uh, some kind of, uh, what do you call it? Uh, 
person with a bad attitude. It, it means, in the old days, it meant someone who had understood un emptiness. It was a name for someone who had understood emptiness. So I don't know how it got its current uh, name. But when I say Aryanagarjana, it means someone who saw emptiness directly. So Aryanagarjana is saying, if you want to stop this cycle of uh, Paula Mundi's sixth grade happening in the eighth grade, and then happening in the freshman year, and then happening in the sophomore year, and going over and over throughout your life until you're old. If you want to stop this cycle, if you want to have a true relationship with someone, if you want to have a successful relationship with someone, I offer you a new idea. I offer you something you've never heard of. Uh, try emptiness. Try to apply emptiness to your relationship. So what we're going to talk about tonight and tomorrow is this new idea. It must be new, right? Because you've tried everything else. Okay? You've tried everything else. Uh, he says, Aryanagarjuna says, try emptiness on your relationship. See if it doesn't help uh, make your relationship more successful. Okay? So we're going we're gonna to try emptiness. Aryanagarjuna was the world's expert on emptiness for all time. Uh, so we're going to have uh, many uh, quotations from his books, uh, his letter to the king about emptiness, and see if we can uh, change our, this cycle change this way our relationships always develop and then deteriorate. Okay? So that's such a difficult subject that I brought Lama Christi to explain that. So. <coughs> Hello? Yeah. Uh, what would we do without him? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> We will become the angel named Loving Eyes who watches over countless worlds and the countless creatures who live on each. And we will take each one of them into our care. So, hmm. We named this talk uh, Deeper Than Love. It was very funny. We were sitting around a table in um, northern India trying to come up with the title for the talk, right? And uh, we were thinking about, well, what's the essence of what we really have to say? What is, um, like, what is the most important thing that we need to tell people? And we came up with, it's not, relationships are not... Uh, about what we think they are. You know, um, normally people, they get into relationships so that they have someone to go to the movies with so they don't have to go by themselves, or someone to fill the other side of the bed at night so they don't feel so lonely, or, um, you know, and, and in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, that's not why we have relationships. It's uh, because, you know, if you go into a relationship just to have some sort of self-gratification, um, it's quickly going to fade. You know, you're quickly going to um, lose interest or they're going to lose interest. It's not enough to keep uh, the relationship going, to, um, to go into a relationship for such a, um, I don't know, superficial reasons. So we thought to share what are the higher reasons for being in a relationship. Mm. We go into... Every interaction that we have with another person is an opportunity to learn something. You know, we meet with someone for 10 minutes on the street, and during that interaction with that other person, something is exchanged. And we have become a different person because we have talked to them, and we have um, interacted with them. Um, I'll give you a, a recent example of something in our own lives. We were in China recently, and we were staying in a rural hut, farmer's house, um, being very quiet, trying to finish all of our translations for our upcoming term at Diamond Mountain. And then, so we didn't spend a lot of time with people. We were actually, you know, by ourselves. But then we had to go into the city for a couple days before we left. And we stayed in this hotel. And in this rural hut, um, it was very damp, and um, all of our clothes got really moldy. <laughs> so I wanted to I wanted to wash them all. Okay, this is uh, 
before we got on the plane and went back to Tucson and gave our talks, I thought, oh, wouldn't it be nice if before I packed all our clothes to go home that we could get them all washed? But we went to this hotel and they said only, um, they said self-laundry service. Um, you just pay for the detergent and you can do it yourself. But of course, while we were in this town, we were in a town very, very close to Tibet. It's called Chengdu. And there's uh, lots of Tibetans there. And we were going to look for a lot of ancient texts. So we had a lot to do. We didn't have time to do laundry. We wanted somebody else to do our laundry. So I go and I ask the hotel owner. I said, could I pay somebody to do our laundry for us? And, you know, she doesn't speak much English. I don't speak a word of Chinese. Um, but she said, just one minute. She runs back. She talks to someone for a minute. She comes back. She says, okay, we'll do our, your laundry for you. Just um, pay for the detergent. And I said, no, I want to pay for someone to do the laundry. I don't want you to do it uh, just for yourself. You know, I can't, I can't let you do that. And she's like, no, no, we won't take any of your money. Um, but we will do your laundry, just pay for the detergent. And we had this fight, you know? And finally someone came up and they're like, let it, let it go, this is Chinese culture. You can't pay someone to do something nice for you. You know? And I was like, wow. You know? Uh, and it taught me so much about my own culture that we think we can buy somebody else's time. And we think that we don't need to be grateful for somebody else when we pay them to do something for us. And it was this five minute interaction with this lady who hardly spoke my language. And I had this incredible uh, learning experience. You know, I just bumped into somebody and then my mind was changed forever. Right? This happens. This happens to you. And it happens to us on a daily basis, actually. Uh, we bump into people and our lives are changed forever by something they said, by something they didn't say, by something they did. Um, but, but we don't... Um, we often appreciate the people we bump into for five minutes more than the people that we spend 24 hours a day with. But the people we spend 24 hours a day with, they're changing our minds constantly. We are interacting with them, and we are being changed by them. And we are learning from them. We are learning from our interactions with our partners, with our children, with our parents, all the people that we spend a lot of time around. Um, they are our holy teachers. Because they are the ones that, um, that we are learning about this life from. And uh, that's more of the Tibetan style of what the relationship is about. You know, come into your relationship looking at your partner as if um, they are the ones that have come to help you learn about life, to help you grow as an individual. Um, my mom is here tonight. She's sitting in the front row. I'm, promised I wouldn't embarrass her, so you don't have to stand up, but uh, <laughs> everyone, that's mom, mom, this is everyone. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, you don't have to stand up. I already saw some of you today, I told you she's a little bit shyer than my father, so, you know, go easy on her, but uh, my mom was... Uh, was my very first guru, you know, she was my teacher in this life. And um, she taught me this really important lesson one day. I was having trouble with my brother. I was like seven, and, or maybe eight, I don't know. And I, um, I call her on the phone, I said, Peter's being mean to me, he hates me, I don't know what to do, you know. And, um, and she said this amazing thing, she's like, well, think about it from his perspective. And then she would list all these reasons why Peter might have been acting the way that he was. And then I was like, oh, you know, once again, I'm like, oh. and um, it changed my whole life. You know, this idea, my mom, she taught me this beautiful idea of taking my mind and looking at the world through another person's eyes, 
through another person's perspective and seeing it from their point of view. And everything changes when you do that, right? If you've done it before, you take your mind, you put it into somebody else's mind, you pretend you're them for just a minute, and all of a sudden you're thinking in a totally different way and your mind expands. This is our opportunity with anybody that we're close to, with anybody that we spend a huge amount of time with. This is their main teaching. This is their main gift to us. It's this opportunity to, um, every day, put your mind into your partner's mind for just a minute. Look at life through their perspective. Think of what they want. Think of what they hope for in life. Think of their desires and their goals. And for just a, a tiny second, put aside your own self-centeredness and focus on somebody else's desires for just a minute. Because, to tell you the truth, doing that, that simple thing that my mom taught me when I was eight years old, doing that thing is what really makes us happy as individuals. And that's the only way that we can be happy. We don't, uh, you could have all the money in the world. You could have all the fame in the world. You could have the cutest partner in the world. But if you're not doing that, if you're not putting aside your own wants for the sake of somebody else, you're never going to be happy in this life. That's the only thing that will make you happy. And so your partner, there they are. A perfect opportunity to practice this. A perfect opportunity to make yourself happy is sitting right next to you all the time. And all you have to do is that simple exercise of putting yourself into their place, putting aside your own self-interest for a minute, and doing what they want, helping them to get what they want. And uh, so this verse, this verse is about that practice, right? This is, um, this is like the preliminary step the, the partner, we interact with one person. We learn how to serve one person. We learn how to put ourselves aside for one person. And we learn how to make ourselves happy. And that's just the beginning. Because this one person is just like a training ground for us. Our real goal in life is to do that with everyone. Imagine, you know, everyone you meet, you put aside your own self-interest. You, you jump into their head. You focus on what they want. And you become happier and happier. I mean, it's exponential. You start with one person, you become very happy. Then you expand. People who have children, they know. You know, they started with their partner, but then they have children and they, they, they open their circle to a couple more people. And uh, finally, you get to the point that it says in this verse, um, where you are watching over countless beings. You are becoming the protector of countless beings on the planet. Uh, you are nurturing them as if they were your one and only child, each and every one of them. So that is, that's why we call this talk uh, Deeper Than Love. You know, because it's, it's just the partner stuff, it's just the first step to um, what everybody wants to grow up to be in life. Yeah. Okay. We'll go to the next verse, uh, which is on page three. Uh, verse 36. This is, uh, can you hear okay? Here? No? I just, uh, is this okay? Can I do it like this? Okay. Uh, this is where uh, Nagarjuna, Aya Nagarjuna gets pretty specific. No, it's crumbling, right? <laughs> Okay, mm, better? Okay, 
uh, this gets pretty specific. The advice gets a little uh, specific. He says, you must avoid three kinds of partners. Uh, the butcher, who loves to be with those who would do you harm. The king or queen, who constantly forces their will upon the household. And the thief, who steals for themselves even small things around the house. Uh, don't forget he's writing this letter to a king who's ruling a, a, a large country. And, and they aren't quite what they sound like. Uh, we have a commentary from the 15th century by a, a, a lama named Randawa, the Sakya Randawa. He was a teacher of a lama named Jatsongkhapa who founded the lineage of the Dai Lamas. He taught the first Dai Lama. So we have an explanation. So I'm going to give you a little bit of explanation uh, using uh, Master Randawa's commentary. Mm. The butcher means, uh, you know, no one would want to have a partner who's not loyal to them, you see? Uh, it's one of the main reasons why uh, relationships break up. Uh, one, one of the partners uh, starts like wandering, uh, one of the partners, uh, in, in a sense, excludes the other partner, and then starts, uh, you know, they start having relationships with other people uh, without the knowledge of the other partner. I mean, this is very common, and this is one of the main reasons why relationships break up. So this kind of partner is like a butcher. You know, behind your back, uh, they are butchering the relationship. They are killing the relationship uh, behind your back. And, and Ayanagarja is telling the king, uh, Udayi Bhadra, uh, watch out for this kind of partner. You know, don't get this kind of partner, okay? That's obvious. Uh, watch out for the king or queen. Uh, this is like a person who takes over a relationship. Uh, it's not an equal relationship anymore. One partner becomes dominant. And, and it can take many forms. Uh, if you are uh, people who give talks together, uh, then one partner is always like deciding what the talk is going to be. And uh, one partner is always talking more. And uh, one partner is always doing the interviews. And they talk during the interviews. And you try to get a word in. And Geshe Michael's still talking. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and there are many uh, variations of this. But basically, you know, financially it happens. Uh, one partner uh, is ha it got, it got, has a good job, the other partner is struggling or can't get a good job. And then the partner who's making more money kind of slowly takes over the relationship by, by force of the money. They, they hold the purse, right? Strings. And, and then it's uncomfortable for the other person. Every time they want to spend money, they have to go to the partner who has the better job and say, can we buy this? You know? And if they go out and buy some, uh, like a dress without telling the dominant economic partner, then they get in trouble, right? But the other dominant economic partner can come home and say, honey, I bought us a speedboat, you know? Uh, <laughs> and uh, now we can go fishing more often, you know? And, uh, you know, and without a thought, you know, uh, without, this is like another kind of domination of relationship, you know? And it goes like that. Uh, this is all, what they call it, the, in Tibetan they call it gyal, gyalmo or gyalpo, jemo or jepo. Uh, the king or queen, who sort of uh, ruins the equality. They, they become the boss of the relationship. Okay? The third one is the thief. And, and, you know, technically in Buddhist uh, morality, if you live in the same house with a partner, you share all the things together. You both own all the things. When they talk about the sin of stealing, uh, you can't steal from your husband or wife. Because according to Buddhist uh, family, relate, you know, the idea of a family, you own everything together. So, like if you opened up your wife's purse and took out $20 and went to the store and bought something, uh, in Buddhism you don't break your morality, because the, the $20 was already a shared item, like that. Uh, so what he's talking about here is where uh, you don't share everything, you see, like you hold back. If, if one of the partners is like considering, this is my property. Uh, this, this part of the house is mine, or, or this, uh, this money that we have is mine, you know, or, or this car belongs to me, and, and you can't have, or, or our time, the time is mine, and not yours, you see. I, I'll decide how we spend the time. It's basically not sharing, okay? It's, it's to, you stop sharing. And, and you declare certain items are yours, 
and cannot be shared by the other partner, right? And, and so we want to avoid these three types of partners. The butcher, who's not loyal in the relationship. Uh, the king or queen, who dominates or takes over the relationship. And then the thief, who, don't, who no longer wants to consider everything shared, uh, or communal property. Now, something is theirs and not yours. It's, it's actually the first step to breaking up a relationship, right? But here's where emptiness comes in, okay? And, and, and we can jump into emptiness right away. Aryanagarjuna would want us to. He would be happy, okay? Don't, don't stop there, Geshe Michael. Go to emptiness, you know? Let's go to emptiness right away. Okay? So let's go to emptiness right away. Let's take the butcher, right? The, the partner who's not loyal to you. The partner who's messing around on the sun, okay? Which is probably, I guess, the, the most common reason why relationships break up. Uh, a person who has not studied emptiness will go to the partner, the other partner, and, and they'll do one of two things. First, fight with them. You know, try to hurt them. Like, go out and try to find yourself someone out to mess around with and leave hints around the house. You know, like, uh, you know, the handkerchief of the lady that you were messing around, you know, or something like that, you know. Like, drop little hints like, uh, oh, you know, you know they're messing around, right? So you drop, you purposely go find someone to mess around with, and then you drop little hints like, yeah, I won't be able to make it to dinner tomorrow, you know, me and, I mean, uh, you know, and, uh, and then you, you like retaliate. This is the retaliation method of dealing with a, a partner who's not loyal to you. Uh, or you could try like the uh, sensitive method. Uh, you go to them, uh, you take them out to dinner, uh, you, to their favorite restaurant, uh, lots of tomatoes, uh, no sweets of any kind. And, uh, and you say, uh, you know, hon, I, I know I'm probably wrong and, and you know, I, I know I'm probably just being jealous, but, you know, there were these four pictures of you, this guy in the newspaper yesterday, uh, <laughs> making out, you know, and, and uh, you know, can we talk this over? Can we come to some kind of a, I'm not mad, I'm not upset, uh, you come back, uh, everything's okay, I forgive him, we will just, you know, so you can do either one. There's the retaliation method, or there's the sensitive uh, forgiveness method, right? The problem is, neither method works all the time. Neither method is reliable, you see? Sometimes the retaliation method works great. They give up the other person, they say, would you give up yours if I give up mine? Yeah, okay. Uh, or sometimes they just come to you and say, you're messing around, I'm leaving tomorrow. And by the way, the lawyer says I can get, you know. And uh, so the retaliation method is not desirable because the result is unpredictable. You, you can't tell whether it's going to work or not. Not a good method. Uh, if they use this for flying airplanes, you wouldn't get in an airplane, you see? Will it fly or will it fall down? We don't know. You know? Uh, will the retaliation method work or not? We don't know. What, so you're going to use it? Uh, then there's the sensitive method, you know, sometimes you're like sensitive, you know, I, I understand, just come back, everything's okay, forgiven, and they're like, I don't need forgiveness, I'm not leaving the other guy, you know, uh, if you don't like it, leave, you know, like that. And, and see, sometimes it just fails, right? So the forgiveness thing, that also is not reliable, it's not a reliable method. What I in the garden is saying, I offer you a reliable method. I offer you a method which works every single time. I offer you a method which is infallible and foolproof. You know, it works for everybody, it works every time. What's this method? Uh, it's karma. Okay. It's karma. What's that mean in, in this case? Uh, your partner never does a single thing that you haven't already done to someone else. Okay, that's the law of karma, okay? Nothing ever happens to you in your relationship except that you have done it to someone else before, okay? Every single problem that your partner uh, exhibits is coming from something you are doing 
or you have done to someone else. Everything. Everything. Okay? So if your partner is not being loyal to you, there's only one cause. Why? You haven't been loyal in the past. Okay? You have somewhere in your life, you have not been loyal. You, know? you have let someone else down. You have not been loyal to someone. And, and you can always find it, you know, if you're honest with yourself. You can always find it. By the way, karma grows. Every 24 hours, karma doubles. Okay? So if it was six years ago and it was just a kiss, and now she's got pictures in the newspaper, that's the way it goes. Okay? Uh, that's the way it goes. You can always find something in your past, you see? So the way, the only true way to make a, a partner loyal to you is to be perfectly loyal to them. Okay, we're sitting in a Christian church, right? Uh, the greatest yogi uh, in the Western world, Jesus, right? Uh, that's, he's why this church is here, right? And, and Jesus said this, you know, if someone comes up and, and socks you, on the side of the face. What should you do? He said, turn the other cheek, right? And I don't know, when I was growing, I don't know about you, but when I was growing up, turn the other cheek meant, uh, you know, don't mind so much. Uh, but what it means is, like, ask them, do you want to punch me on the other side also? That's what it, uh, turn the other cheek, offer them your left cheek. Your partner punches you in the right face, side of the face, say, would you like to hit me on the left side also? And it's not in a sarcastic way, like it's not like some kind of, uh, yeah, well hit me again, see if I care, you know? It's not like that. Uh, it's not like that. It's like, uh, don't return violence with violence. You see, if violence is done to you, it's because of some violence you have done to someone in the past. If your partner is doing you violence, it's because some kind of violence you have done in the past. So what's the single most stupidest thing you can do if your partner does violence to you? To do violence back to them. This is the only way to continue the violence. It's like Iraq, you know what I mean? This is the only way to keep it going, is to react with violence, you see? So, someone is uh, not loyal to you, according to this idea of emptiness, the only thing you can do, the best thing to do, is, is in return, in response, as a reaction, be more loyal to them. Okay? Be more kind to them. Uh, purposely. And dedicated to that karma. What's that got to do with emptiness? Why do you call that emptiness? Why don't you call that karma? Uh, emptiness means nothing else works. Look for anything else that works and you'll come up with zero. That's the meaning of emptiness. That's all emptiness means. Okay? Find me a partner who has not been loyal to you that is not coming from you. And you come up with a big fat zero. And that's the meaning of emptiness. Okay? You can never find a, a partner who's not loyal to you that's not your fault. You see? That's emptiness. That's the real meaning of emptiness. It's not a black hole. It's not trying to think about nothing. And it's certainly not that nothing matters morally. That's all Nyang Makambo. Okay? That's not correct. Okay? Real emptiness means find me a partner who has not been loyal to you, which is not your own fault which is not because of some kind of lack of loyalty in your own heart. You'll never find one, okay? And, and this is a great teaching. This is a great wisdom. All the great yogis of all religions. That's what Jesus meant when he said, let them sock you on the other side, okay? Uh, respond this way, with more kindness. Love the people who hate you. Love your enemies. Take care of the people who are not loyal to you. Serve them more. Uh, in response. And then they will be more loyal, they will become loyal, you see? It's very beautiful. And it's completely impossible to do. Okay. Uh, 
Find rather a partner who makes your heart glad. Someone who's like a sister or brother, a helpmate for your life. Someone who wants the best for you, just as your mother would. He. Someone who wants to devote themselves to you, to be your loving servant. And when they come, then honor them. Put them on your altar as your angel. Mm. So, this is Arya Nagarjuna's advice to the king. Avoid three kinds of partners and then find this wonderful partner instead. But we know, mm, because of karma and emptiness, that you can't really find a partner like that out there in the world. You know, you could go to China, you could go to Timbuktu, and you're not going to find this perfect person. Uh, because the perfect person is not out there. The perfect person is, is coming from you. Uh, so, according to the Buddhist tradition, we can't ever find partner. We have to create the perfect partner. We have to create them. And how do we create them? By being the perfect partner ourselves. So, so this now, this verse now, it becomes a guide not um, to, for us to look scouring the earth and the outside world for who we can find that matches exactly this stuff, but it becomes a guideline for how we should act to our own partner on a day-to-day -day basis. We should be like a, a loving sibling to our partners, a sister or brother, a helpmate for their life. What does that mean? It means, you know, when they come home and they've got a great idea to share with you from, or they've just had a great day at work and they want to tell you all about it, then, then you stop what you're doing and you listen to them and you, um, you get excited for them and be encouraged and support them in whatever kind of endeavor they're, they're doing. You know, or when they have a bad day at work, you, um, you're there for them as a shoulder to cry on. You stop what you're doing and you're always there. Like this sister or brother thing, it's like you're a sister or a brother for life. You know, you don't, you're not like a sister for half your life and then you decide, oh, I just want to be somebody else's sister now. You can't do that. You know, it's, um, once you're a sister or a brother to someone, you're sort of stuck there for all your life. And that's what the vows are supposed to be about. That's what the, that's what the vows of taking a partner are, are about. You, you take those vows and you never give them up. You are there with them for life. And you just commit to it, whatever happens. You know, you just commit your mind. In America these days, you know, people, they have such negative views. They think, they go into a partnership and they think, well, maybe it'll last a year, maybe it'll last 10 years, you know, maybe, maybe I have something else to do later. And they don't, like, in your mind you never commit. And how is it ever supposed to work? How are they ever supposed to commit to you if in your mind you're never committed to them? Like, how is that ever supposed to happen? You have to, you have to make the leap. You have to jump. This is the person I'm committed to. That's it. And then be there. And, and show them that you're there. And show them you're committed to them for life. And then, that's what they will be to you. Because that's how you create a committed partner that's there for you for life. That's, um, that's the simple rule of karma. You, you get what you give out. You know, it's, it's not any more difficult than that. And then you have to be like a mother to them. That's the next part of the verse, right? Mm. You have to, you know, put aside, we talked about it before, put aside your own self-interest. Get into their mind, get into their perspective. Uh, give them the thing that they most want in the world. You know, my mom, she's like the best mom in the world. I know you think you have the best mom in the world, but that's because you don't know my mom. <laughs> my mom really is the best mom. We have a fight about this, because he thinks his mom is the best in the world, but, you know, I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, she was, she was always there for me. Uh, like, my whole life, 
She worked so hard for me to put me through school and get me all the clothes that all the other kids have so I could be cool in school, and especially those neat little sneakers that cost 50 bucks and we didn't have 50 bucks. And, you know, and um, she made sure that I, you know, if I wanted to do dance, I did dance. If I wanted to do gymnastics, I did gymnastics. And she drove me everywhere all across the city. We lived in Los Angeles. So it's a big city. It's a lot of driving. And uh, she had no free time. For like the whole 17 years I was living with her, she had no free time. She was just working for me constantly. This, that, the other. I didn't even notice. You know, I didn't even thank her once. So I'm thanking you now. In front of all these people, I'm thanking you. It's a little bit late, I know. But, but this is how we have to be for our partners. You know, we have to uh, give up all our free time and... Uh, throw ourselves into the relationship and serve them. This is the next, uh, the next quality that we want to be like, in a, that we want to be as a partner, and that, so that we can get the partner who's like that for us, right? Always remember, this is a, you get what you give school. Mm. So we should devote ourselves to our partners like a servant. And then everyone's little hairs rise up in their back and they say, I don't want to be a servant. <laughs> you know? um, we should serve them like a servant. Everybody in America, they're like big on this equality stuff. They're like, I don't want servant. I want us to be equal partnership, you know? But see, the funny thing about this equality is um, when we're measuring it in our own minds, um, we always tip the scales. You know, and we don't even realize we're doing it because because we don't see what they're giving us. We're totally blind to what our partner is giving us. We are um, totally ungrateful for like they're coming home from work because they know that that we want dinner at a certain time, so they come home from work early and they decide not to do a certain thing that they really wanted to do, and you just don't notice that. You know, you don't notice that they've made that great effort. Or, um, or you notice, but you just kind of, you forget when it comes to evening out the, to being equal, right? Our minds just never go to how much work they've, they've put into the relationship. So, in the Buddhist tradition, in a practical way, what we always say is just be totally unfair in their favor. Just do the dishes every night. You know, don't be like, oh, I did the dishes last night, you have to do them tonight, you know. Um, don't, don't do that. Just do them every night. And do them happily. Like, take out the garbage all the time. And don't make them do it at all. And, and just be totally unfair in their favor. And uh, something really wonderful will happen. You, you do this as a practice to, uh, to cultivate this this pure love for the other person. You know, I'm, I'm serving you. You are my teacher. You are my wonderful teacher. And that's what the next verse says. You know, you realize what we were saying before, that, that this person that's right next to you is giving you a profound opportunity to um, open your heart and to see things from another perspective. So they are, they are your teacher. And they are your holy guide. And they, have, uh, they are your angel, in a sense. Right? Mm. We like to say, imagine that your partner has just come to you on this planet just for you. Just appeared to you so that you can learn this sacred art of opening your heart to just one other person. You can learn the sacred art of how to actually really love someone. And if that's true... If you learn how to love somebody because of this other person, then they are like the highest God to you. You know? Because that art of love is something so precious and so powerful that if somebody comes and they can actually teach you that, then you better like bow down to them and put them on your altar. And then if you have that idea of them in your mind already as being someone who's who's teaching you such a high art as learning how to love someone, if you have that idea in your mind, then it will be easy to do the dishes every night because you will be grateful to them. 
you will want to serve them because they're giving you such a great gift. And what happens when you honor them as this uh, special teacher, uh, your mind starts to shift. And more and more, you start to actually see them as a, a holy teacher for you, as a holy guide, as someone special. So at the beginning, it's kind of forced. You know, yeah, yeah, you're my holy teacher. <laughs> you know? um, but then, you know, you force it at the beginning, but then you start to see signs. They start to say something to you that's remarkably profound, and you're like, oh, you actually, you are my teacher. Or you start to feel your heart just opening up, and you know it's because of them. And, and you start to feel grateful to them, and it's like an upward spiral, because the more grateful you feel towards the partner, then the more special the partner becomes, because as we say, the partner is empty. You know, you've created them. So by, by doing this last thing, which is like the most magical thing of all, it's the, it's the height of creating a partner, a perfect partner. Mm. You, you create a holy being that's, that sits next to you and, and a holy being to live the rest of your life with. And, uh, and then it's easy, then it's easy to do this partner thing. Yeah. Uh, we're going to take a break. Uh, we, We'd like to meet you if you're new or you're not going to be around at the, at the university for the next couple of weeks. Uh, we'd like to, if you want to come up and say hi or ask a personal question, um, we'd like to make two lines that we can cover more people. Um, try not to hang out up here because there will be people behind you who, who, who want to talk to us too. Uh, if you're going to see us in the next few weeks, then give the other people a chance. And we'll probably have a couple of bouncers up here. Uh, if it looks like you're going to stay for half an hour. Uh, please uh, enjoy the refreshments. Uh, be generous. It gets our younger students to, to study in the Tibetan monasteries. Uh, I personally have to see uh, Venerable Eli, Gabriela from Mexico City, Jamie and Ora. Okay? We'll start in about 15 minutes, uh, Diamond Mountain time. Okay, we'll start. Uh, there are two uh, study groups going on in Tucson for spiritual partners. Uh, one is a discussion group and one is a meditation group. So I, I wanted to let you know the times and places that they meet. As far as I know, they're both free, right? Okay, good. Uh, the discussion group is going to have a potluck dinner tomorrow. <laughs> Sunday at 5 o'clock on Edison Street, 2805 East Edison Street. Uh, that's uh, Candy Hirsch and her husband Gary. Do you want to stand up just so people uh, don't be shy? Uh, Gary's the head of Enlightened Business Institute. Uh, Candy also works at Canyon Ranch uh, and teaches there. So. Uh, if, you, if you'd like to get into a group, it's been going on for about five months already, and it's a sweet group, and they just uh, basically talk about these ideas, and, and it's more personal, and you can get uh, more, more personal instruction on, on what you're working on. The meditation group for spiritual partners is headed by uh, Rob Haggerty and his partner, Anne. You guys want to stand up? Uh, <laughs> Uh, they're, they'll be meeting at Anjali Yoga Studio. What street is that on? 7th Street, off 4th Avenue. Uh, it starts this Wednesday. At, it's a, it's a, it starts at 7.15. It goes for about an hour. And uh, they'll be doing spiritual partners. That's kind of like you can come with your partner and learn some authentic teachings on uh, meditations that you can do that will help you in your spiritual partnership. 
Uh, tomorrow we'll go into some more uh, resources that are available around Tucson. Uh, like, we'll give you the full stick tomorrow. But those two uh, groups are, are meeting, and it's a lot of fun, and it's free. So if you'd like to talk to them after the talk, uh, please do. Okay. We'll go on to the next uh, page of the text. It's page 5, and it's uh, verse 17. The things that people do are of three different types, like pictures drawn upon water, or in the dirt, or on stone. Let your negative emotions be like the first, and let your attempts to live a spiritual life be like the last. Uh, this is a very famous Buddhist idea. Like, if you went out, if you went out to a lake, and uh, you wrote on it, uh, my partner is a schmuck, uh, with a stick in the wa on the water, right? Then by the time you finish schmuck, uh, my partner would be gone. You see what I mean? Because uh, words written on water, they don't last so long. You know? And then, uh, but if you, if you went out and, and carved into a piece of stone, you know, my partner came from heaven to teach me how to be a, a less angry person, you know, and you carved it in stone, then that would stay for, for many years, maybe a couple of hundred years, you see? And this is Ayanagar, this is a famous Buddhist idea. Uh, when you have a, a fight with your partner, when you have a quarrel, uh, when, you, when, when words are exchanged between you and your partner, uh, that's one thing. In Tibetan they call toa. Toa means, uh, that's a state of anger. You're in a, toa means anger in the moment, you see. Uh, in, a, in a moment of you're tired, or uh, you've had a hard week uh, at work, uh, things aren't going right, and then it's easy to get angry. You know, things that wouldn't normally make you angry, they get you angry. And then, and then something comes out of your mouth towards your partner, right? Uh, you say something, uh, you think something, you do something. Uh, those kind of uh, actions, you should write them in water, you see? And then you should let them go. You see, Torah means, uh, if you can't control yourself in the moment and something pops out, that's one thing. But don't go to kunzin. Kunzin means uh, you hold it, you know, you keep it, you store it, you fester it, you see? Like, you, you say, oh, you know, uh, you said that thing to me three days ago, and you don't let it go. Uh, you don't forget, you see? You keep holding on to it. Uh, I, I, I heard a Buddhist nun, a Western Buddhist nun speak one time, and she said, uh, I asked people, did you study the Heart Sutra? This is a famous book. They say, yes. Can you tell me a few lines from it? Can you tell me the Ten Commandments? I can give you about three. You see what I mean? And then they say, no, I can't. You know? Well, can you tell me what your last partner told you just as you were breaking up? Yeah, we were in the room, we were in a restaurant, and they said, you know, I really can't stand the way you don't put the toilet lid down when it's my turn, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and then they said, so I gotta leave you, you know, and I'll never forget these words, you know. So these kind of words, let, let the bad ones go. Let them be written on water between you, okay? Don't hold on to them. If you can't control yourself in the moment because of some, uh, you're tired, or, or, or you're upset from something else at work, then the moment of anger comes, you say something, they say something, let it be written on water, let it go. Then just let it go, forget it. Just forget it. Then uh, when something sweet happens, you know, like, uh, I don't know, we were in Hong Kong and we went out and, and, and we had a really excellent day. Uh, we were getting together some special things for a ceremony that we're having. And, and it was a special day, and then we asked this guy, this tailor, you know, he said, Where, where's a good restaurant, you know? And he says, oh, well, I'm not well, it's well, huh? you know? And we're like, could somebody write that down for us? You know, and, and they write it down, and, uh, and we, you know, we said, we had such a holy day, we had such a fine day, we, we accomplished uh, what we were in China to do, this is our last night, this is the tailor's favorite restaurant, 
uh, you go through this arcade of really uh, dingy shops, you know, and then there's no sign or anything. You go into the stairwell, you go up these crummy concrete uh, couple of floors, and then you come out into this huge, beautiful Chinese restaurant. It's like secret. None of the tourists know about it, you know? And, and we're like, oh, you know, we're special. We get to be in this restaurant, you know? And we sit down and we open up the menu and it's all in Chinese. And, and we're like, we'll take one of these, one of these, one of these. And then uh, they bring the food, you know? And it's like abalone eyeballs and, and, uh, <laughs> no, like, and, it, and we're like, uh, we don't eat meat, we don't eat fish, we don't eat egg, you know, and they're like, are you crazy? This is Hong Kong's best seafood restaurant, you know, and we don't make vegetarian food here, you know, and, and then these things, like these special moments of your life, uh, <laughs> your last night in Hong Kong, after after two months with the bed bugs in, in, the, in the peasant's house, right? And, and you're having this special dinner of abalone eyeballs together, you know? <laughs> and, uh, you know, those moments should be written in stone, you see? <laughs> uh, those moments you should think about again and again. The good times. Uh, <laughs> like purposely, they say in, in meditation, meditation, the word for meditation in Tibetan is gomba. Goma means you think about something over and over so many times that it gets stuck in your brain. That's the Tibetan word for meditation. Goma means think about the nice day in Hong Kong, finishing that two months of work together, which was hard, some of it was hard. And then that last night of celebration with the abalone eyes. And uh, put those moments in stone, you know, remember those moments. And then the night that you got mad and she blew up or you blew up and you said something, let that be written in water, you see, let it go, okay? Uh, there's a, karmically, as far as emptiness, there's an important thing here. Every time you relive an experience, you replant that karma, you see? Every time you review the last fight you had and how bad they were to say that thing to you, uh, you plant it one more time, you see? Because to think about what someone told you is the same as to hear it again one more time, karmically. So like if you review the thing that they said to you one more time, every time you review it, you get another bad karma in your mind. You get another uh, incident in the future coming again. So bad things that happen between you and your partner, let it be written in water. Let it go. Okay? Just forget it. Why? Because that's more moral, or because that will make you happier, or because you're going to pretend it didn't happen? No. But because if you review it, then you'll plant another incident in your mind. You see? If you, if you go over one more time what they said about the toilet seat, you know, then you plant another incident in your mind. Another one will happen in the future, you see? So karmically, it's, it's what the Dalai Lama calls enlightened self-interest. It's in your interest to let it go. Uh, let, the things be, let the negative things between you be written on water. And in the good times, the sweet times, the, the holy moments between you, write that in stone, you know? Every day uh, when you're driving or, or, or you're at lunch or you're eating something, bring it up purposely in your mind, you see? Bring up the good times again and again in your mind. Like most of the time during the day, we're thinking, right? And most of the thoughts are just random. We just follow wherever our mind is going. We just follow. We like, have no control over it. The idea here is take control of your mind during your free time. You know, you're, you're driving somewhere, you have free time to think about something. You're eating, you have free time to think about something. In the bathroom, you have free time to think about something. Uh, especially if you've just been to China. Uh, and, uh, no, and you have... You have free time. So, so direct your mind, you know. Put some new good karmas in your mind, you see. Don't let your mind just float aimlessly in the free moments that you have. Go to the day in Hong Kong, the holy day that you spent today together. You were celebrating this, this great preparation you were making for this ceremony that we're having at Diamond Mountain. Like, go back to that. Plant it again in your mind. 
and that karma will increase and increase and increase, and then you'll have more and more good days. So that's the idea. They say, write the good days in stone, and let the bad days go like words on water. Okay, that's that's our inner garden. Okay. Hmm. Well, we're we're already running a little bit late here, but uh, we'll do one quick verse more, right? Hmm. There is no high spiritual accomplishment equal to keeping your patience in the moment of anger. Never give anger an opening. The Buddha himself said that a person who can overcome anger cannot be stopped from reaching enlightenment itself. Mm. So, Gishin Michael was talking about um, uh, keeping your anger inside is not a very good thing. But this verse is talking about having anger in the first place <laughs> is not a very good thing. So even when you're tired, or even when you've had a bad day, or even when things are not going your way, um, you have to control your mind. You have to control yourself. And, you know, the easiest person to get angry at is the person that you're closest to. That's the easiest person to take it out on. And normally, it's not their fault. You know, um, I mean, just be honest with yourself. Um, you can't yell at your boss, you'll get fired. You know, you can't yell at people on the street that piss you off because they drive away too fast. You can't, <laughs> you can't, you, you just like, you just don't have the opportunity to yell at the people that, that you want to yell at. So, you know, then you go home and, hey, they're sitting there. <laughs> and you're, um, it's not a good habit to, to yell at your partner, <laughs> get angry at your partner. Mm. But it's, you know, what to do if, uh, if your partner yells at you first? Mm. What to do? I mean, you got to yell back, right? No, no. You don't have to yell back. And this is the verse that says you don't have to yell back. This is the verse that gives you sort of permission. Oh, you can just sit there. Mm, you know, don't yell back. But it also says, this verse, that the hardest thing in the world is not yelling back. It's the hardest thing in the world. Because at the moment, you know, your partner is also the person who knows you the best. So if your partner happens to be angry, and they want to get a rise out of you, they know exactly what button to push that will make you angry back. I mean, that's just like the role of the partner, you know, they just, <laughs> they know these things about us, you know, and, uh, and so the very hardest thing you could do when they know you the best of anybody in the whole world and they press that one button that you just can't stand to be pressed is to control yourself, to control your mind in that moment is the highest spiritual accomplishment you could ever do. It's the hardest thing to do and it's the highest thing to do. Mm. They talk a lot in the scriptures about how anger can hurt us. You know, His Holiness is very uh, cute on this subject. He always talks about the ulcers that you'll get if you keep uh, getting angry at people. Or you won't be able to sleep. Or, you know, your face will get all these ugly wrinkles in it. And, and that's true. And it's like, even, even if karma and emptiness are not true, anger is just not a good way to go. Right? Because, you know, you'll, you'll hurt yourself. You don't usually hurt the other person as much as you hurt yourself when you get angry. And then, um, you know, in those moments of anger, if you lose control of your mind, something could come out of your mouth that permanently damages the relationship. Um, you've worked on a relationship for many years. You've cultivated it very nicely. You've put so much time in it. But then that one thing slips out of your mouth that that like cuts all that work, you know, and just damages it all in one single syllable. And that's the power, that's the negative power of anger, is uh, it can destroy all of this good work for many, many years with a single word. So anger is sort of very dangerous for us, who are, we are trying to cultivate uh, love, we are trying to use our partner as a, 
a spiritual practice to open our hearts so that we can become um, a more spiritual person to the world around us. So we can learn how to take care of the world around us. And anger is just exactly the opposite of that. You know, It just cuts all our work down in a single moment. Mm. But uh, practically speaking, you know, this is all well and good. How do we deal with it? You know, how do we deal with it in the very moment that we're about to get angry? Mm. First of all, you have to have consciously in your thoughts two things. One, um, the goal of who you want to be. You know, I... I want to be a person who helps everybody that I meet. Like, I want to be a person who, when I walk through the door to the grocery store, I bring light to the person behind the counter. I want to be the kind of person who um, people know that they can call me uh, up with their problems because I'm always there to help them. You know, you have to get in your mind the kind of person you want to be. And then when it happens that uh, your button is about to be pushed, you call that to mind. The person who I want to be would never respond to, with anger in this moment. So you use the, you know, your, your goal of who you see yourself as in the future to stop yourself from getting angry, right? Mm. Then the other thing that's very helpful in the moment of anger, I said two things, right? Uh, is how you see your partner in that moment. And this is, this is very hard, because in the moment, you know, you're, you're irritated with them, you're about to go over the cliff into actually angry, right? But um, if, in, if in those moments, you can recall what we talked about, um, that this person has come to us um, it's like they are supposed to be our divine holy teacher and uh, even in this moment they're teaching us if you can you can wrap your mind around that in the, the incredible moment of almost anger then the anger will shift the anger will go away those two things yourself who you want to be won't get angry your partner is, is a holy person who is teaching you. I can't get angry at them. I have to be grateful to them, or at least not get angry at them, right? Mm. They say, uh, Master Shanti Deva, who is a very famous uh, yogi in ancient India, and he's one of my favorite uh, writers of all the Buddhist scriptures, he talks about this kind of spiritual, this, uh, spiritual alliance that you get with another person who... Um, who pisses you off regularly. Um, they say that you can, if you can overcome your anger, you can reach enlightenment itself. So the person who is most likely to make you angry, which is the person who's closest to you because they know how to push your button, so it's always like the person you also love the most. <laughs> um, this person you can form a spiritual uh, contract with. Okay, you, may, you try and make me angry, give it your best shot, and I will try and keep my patience. And you make it like a game, you know, like, okay, here it goes. You go, you go, say, give it to me, you know, <laughs> like, like, give me your best shot, and I'll, I'll... <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'll be patient, I won't get angry at you, you know, and then... I don't know, it takes 10 seconds, and then they make you angry, and then the next time it takes 20 seconds, and they make you angry, and then the next time, you know, they're working on you for about 10 minutes before you get angry, and then, you know, the, the time slowly widens, um, and your patience starts to increase, and you start to get closer and closer to um, the ultimate goal, which is, which is enlightenment itself. Um, all, all Buddhist scriptures talk about the real goal of every single partnership that you have, every single relationship that you have being getting to enlightenment. And uh, 
Do you have time? I don't know. Enlightenment is... Uh, <laughs> That was a long story. <laughs> Most of you here already know, but um, we are here uh, in these human bodies of flesh and blood and bone that have to age and have to get old and die and get reborn again and suffer and die and see other people that we know suffer and um, not be able to help them and not be able to do anything about it. This is only um, like a temporary stop for us. We have a higher goal in mind. We have an evolutionary process that we can move on to from this. And what that is, is um, a body that's made not of flesh and bone, that's, that doesn't have any kind of pain and doesn't have to die, but it's a body made of light. And it's a body that can go to many people on many worlds in a single instant and be at their side and be helping them and be teaching them and guiding them. And this is the secret goal in everybody's heart, you know, to be this being of light who goes to millions of worlds and helps millions of beings. Uh, this is what we all truly, deep down inside, want to be because it's like the most blissful state of existence. You can't even imagine it. You can't even imagine how, how beautiful it would be. So, you know, keeping your patience with your partner is going to get you there. Uh, do I have to say any more? <laughs> if you can remember that in the moment of uh, that crucial moment. Uh, they say there's gradual stages, you know, you first you get like off balance, like something happens that's uncomfortable for you and it throws you off balance and then from that off balance you start to get upset and then from the upset you get irritated and then from irritation goes to anger. So you have to catch yourself at the moment of off balance, between off balance and upset. You know, that's the, that's the crucial moment where you have to grab the mind and say, okay, things are not happening the way I'd like them. Okay, okay, but, but one, you know, I, I want to be, I want to be that person who, who goes to all planets and helps all beings in the body made of light thing. That sounds really cool. Um, and two, you know, this person has been sent to me uh, and they're, they're, the reason that they're even pushing my buttons in the first place is because they want me to get there too. They want me to get there too. In fact, they want me to get there even more than I want to get there. And so, you know, for, for them, because of their kindness, I'm not going to get angry right now. And then, uh, if you practice this, Strangely, the people that make you angry will start to disappear and you'll have less and less opportunities to practice. <laughs> and then they'll become really precious to you when someone makes you angry. It's like, oh, oh, thank you. I, it's been a really long time since I had someone press that button, you know. Um, because every, you know, the way we react, you know, it's empty. If you react with anger, you're going to get anger the next time. You're going to create more anger in your life. If you react with patience, you're going to stop that anger in its tracks. And you won't be faced with angry people in your life. You can make them disappear that way. So you get perfected and your world gets perfected at the same time. And it's all due to this beautiful holy being who is your partner. Oh, so we'll continue this talk tomorrow. Uh, we have to go deeper into emptiness. We'll go deeper into the idea of emptiness. But then we also have to make it practical. Like how do you use, if you're going to take me deeper into emptiness, how can I use that uh, to find a partner, uh, to keep a partner, be happy with my partner, okay? So we'll go deeper into the theory, but we'll connect it more to your real life also. So we'll, we'll continue. It'll be a, a different set of verses tomorrow. I think same time. 
Same time, same place, I think, right? Am I right? We'll probably be here at 7.30. No, don't tell them that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We have the same other class tomorrow. Um, yeah. Just to warn you. Just to be honest with all of you friends of ours. Uh, we have a custom in the Buddhist tradition at the end of a teaching. We did a good karma here tonight. Everybody would like to have a nice relationship. Uh, we're exploring possibly the only way that you can ever make it really work. So that's a really good karma. We all collected a good karma. So the best way to keep something is to give it away. Uh, so we do this special prayer. Uh, Christy will chant it. Christy Lao will chant it. And then you just hold out your hands like this. Everybody, yeah. And uh, you imagine that uh, the good karma you made, the good seeds in your mind, you are giving away to the people in Tucson. So that everybody in Tucson could have a successful relationship, like by Christmas, okay? <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. Like light coming out of your heart, okay? And the best way to cement the karma in your mind is to give it away right now, okay? So we'll do this chant. Sashi Fuki Thank you.